Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I wanted to give everyone out there an update on my whole learning to fly experience. So yeah, the last few months I've been going maybe once or twice a week, usually only getting to fly once a week, unfortunately, but I'm landing fine, doing all my ground maneuvers. Apparently, uh, I'm told that I my maneuvers are check right level right now. Not sure about the landings just yet, but I do get quite some good ones. I've never stalled the aircraft unless the instructor has told me, so that seems pretty good. But this week was a big step because I had to perform my uh, aviation written exam. And this is basically a multiple choice exam where they put you in a room and you have to answer 60 questions about you know, regulations, aerodynamics, flying planes, not killing yourself. You're in a room, you have paper, pencil, you can bring in a calculator of your choice, but this can't be like a general purpose computer that everybody uses these days to use flight planning. So uh, I decided to challenge myself a little and use this. This is a 1942 E-6B, right? And the dash is actually in a subtly different position. This is created for the US Army Air Forces uh, just when you know, World War II was just uh, ramping up. And it is basically a mechanical slide rule device which you can use for flight planning to do basic math. And on the other side, there is a wind deflection system where you can uh, calculate wind deviations. That's what I wanted to use, a 80-year-old analog computer for a 21st century aviation exam. So yeah, that's uh, a yeah. 1942. That is awesome. uh, they, Beautiful. They, they started printing those up straight after, uh, you know, as they were getting ready for the war. Awesome. Okay, but I can use that'll that? Be, that'll be just fine. Yes, excellent. And guess who just got a hundred percent in his aviation exam? That's right, that's right. Oh yeah, baby. Oh yeah, that's the thing. But honestly, I mean, look, I've been relishing taking tests for a very long time. I, I think uh, I miss them from my days at college, right? Where there were very strict expectations and you knew exactly what you had to do. And I think I wanted to go back and really do this well. The truth is that, you know, while this device may be 80 years old, sure, the math that it has to do hasn't really changed. There's a few features in newer versions which you can still buy and there are electronic versions. So anyway, if you're a nerd like me uh, that has never seen these flight computers before, I actually wanted to show you how they work. Now, they're basically slide rules, but yeah, here's a little demo. Okay, uh, I kind of want to show you how these uh, operate. So yeah, this is the new one. This is an E6-B flight computer, and this is a the old one from 1942. It's an E-6B. Uh, you can see the order number here from you know, 42, I guess, is 1942. I gather that's when this was, was made. Uh, they have two sides. One is basically a slide rule conversion ring that lets you do like multiplication, division, and unit conversion. The flip side is a wind correction page, which uh, lets you use these rotating disks to apply wind correction, and I'll show you how that works. So the modern one is objectively better in many, many ways. It has more conversions, more useful bits and pieces on it. Uh, it also has a whole bunch of notes on it, which can be very helpful if you say are in an exam and need to be able to read these things off. For example, you have this uh, wind correction chart, which is basically signs and cosines and everything. Or, sorry, the wind component chart. You have all your flight plan information. You even have a nice little ruler down the edge that you can use if you do not have your handy little protractor. Uh, this one misses a lot of that stuff, but, you know, it is way older than me, so it is kind of cool. But I'm going to use this one to show you how they basically operate. So, yeah, main thing it does is multiplications. So, a simple way to do it is to say, Let's figure out how fast we're going. So we're going to say our airspeed is 80 knots, 80 kilometers per hour, 80 miles per hour. It doesn't matter. You point the 60 at the 80. And then you say, OK, I've been traveling for an hour 40. How far have I gone? Well, it says about 134 miles, kilometers or whatever. Right? It doesn't really matter. All it's doing is multiplication. 
If you put the, the 10, the one zero at the top and you follow this around, you see that there's basically a factor of 10 in every rotation. So, uh, you know, you have to take do the factors of 10 on your own, which shouldn't be a problem assuming that you are thinking in base 10, which most of you probably do unless you're really, really into computers. Uh, you can do unit conversions simply, right? So on the outside, here's an easy one. You can convert nautical miles to statute miles. So you put the one zero there and that means say 10 nautical miles is uh, about uh, 11.5 regular miles. Uh, you can do a Mach speed conversion to regular speed. So if the air, this is the air temperature here, say the air temperature is minus 10 Celsius, then uh, your Mach 1 is 630 knots or thereabouts. You can also do unit conversion by matching the things on the outside to the things on the inside. If you want to say convert pounds of fuel into gallons, you line up US gallon with fuel pounds and you'll see that one gallon is about six pounds of fuel. Isn't that magic? Yeah, it's basically, you know, logarithms, which is of course a Scottish invention. Um, that's all very useful. You have uh, atmosphere conversions using these windows here. A uh, little temperature conversion scale across the bottom for Celsius to Fahrenheit. And I know that many of you are in Europe and countries that actually have a sane approach to measurement and you're complaining about the use of these uh, imperial you know, American measurements. But I'll tell you that as a pilot, in a single like METAR weather report, I'm dealing with knots of speed, statute miles, nautical miles and statute miles. I'm dealing with feet of altitude. I'm dealing with pressure in inches of mercury and temperatures in Celsius, right? There, there's quite a lot of different units that you end up using. So anyway, the wind chart is the other interesting one on the site. So let's just say you are dealing with winds from the east that are about 20 knots. So what you do is you take the point, you move it to the bit middle there, and now I'm going to find your 20 knots up here, right? and do an X like that, right? So that's roughly where 20 knots is. Now, let's say I'm traveling to the northeast at 45 degrees. Now, what I want to do is take this point and then move it onto the speed that I'm, I'm traveling at or what my airspeed indicator says. So say I'm travel, it tells me I'm traveling at 150 knots, right? So I put my speed on there and it tells me that the wind is actually blowing me and slowing me down to about 135 knots. And if I want to stay on course, I should actually steer about five degrees to the right to actually compensate for the wind. It is a beautiful, elegant little tool and you can use them very quickly once you get used to them. Right, really, like the only thing that has changed, the main thing that has changed with flying is obviously there's some improvements in technology in the aircraft in terms of glass cockpits and uh, other sort of, you know, navigation devices. But the regulations, that's the main thing that's different. There's so many more regulations that FAA has imposed on people. And knowing those is very important to passing the test. And so, I, you know, I'm guessing that some of you might actually be interested in some tips that I might have for passing this exam. Now, this is obviously the American exam. It is a 60 question, multiple choice. There's three choices. And let's think about this for a second. If you think that one out of three means you get one third of the answers right, then that means you only need to know 55% of the questions and you can guess the other 45 and get the 70 passing grade. That might seem to be kind of easy. The truth is though, the written test is largely a sort of formality for getting through to the next step because when you get your written test results back, they'll tell you which areas you screwed up in and you have to go back to your flight instructor and they have to then school you in it, certify that you've been schooled in it and then the examiner, when you're taking your actual test, they will drill down on you and make sure that you know that stuff. There is definitely an argument that I should have done everything right except the aerodynamics, you know, something that I actually understood. But no, I really wanted to get that 100%. But yeah, how, how did I manage to do well? Uh, first of all, I, I did read all the material that was available. Yeah, that seems kind of obvious. But there's also a ton of different ground schools on YouTube for free. And while I didn't necessarily watch them all, 
I listened to them all. If I was out hiking, I would put those on in the background and they would be going on about things that I needed to know. And I'd be like, yeah, I know this, I know this. Oh, didn't know that. Remember, uh, the other important thing for getting the best score you can is test prep stuff. And there's a couple of companies that do this. My main test prep work was actually done on the $15 Sporties iOS app, which I could run on my phone or on an iPad. Now, it's hard to do things like the navigation questions when you've got an iPhone screen. It's just way too small. But uh, those aren't the ones I was worried about. I was worried about the, you know, the conclusions, the weather, the regulations, right? Things where you have three options and you have to figure out what is correct. And sometimes the obvious answer is not the right one because it's testing a specific part of the language and the regulations. Like, you know, if you're approaching an airport to land uh, on a, you know, a glide slope, VASI glide slope indicator, um, you know, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to follow that? Apparently not. You're supposed to say, no, I remain above that indicator because there's a specific language in the regs that says you are supposed to remain above the glide slope until necessary for landing. And it's the unne until necessary for landing, they cut that off and it seems really wrong that you would not follow the glide slope. But yeah, those questions, I'm going to say that for the test prep I did, all those type of questions, they were all covered by my test prep stuff. So you could sit down anywhere, go through a bunch of these, you know, while you were waiting for your kids to like, you know, do something like, you know, get their nose pierced or whatever. And uh, <laughs> like, learn a little, right? But also, uh, it's very important to learn to do the navigation stuff, actually learn to use these things to, you know, do your wind deflection, do your calculations, do the stuff shorthand, right? And also realize that for the test, while those questions are all supposed to be secret, right? The supplemental material with the figures and the charts, uh, the weight and balance information, all that stuff that's used by the test, that is public. It was published in 2018. It's still valid. You can download it. You can even buy a physical copy and use that. And when you're in the middle of the test, you will have this. And sometimes you will get a question where you can't be 100% sure of the answer, but you know the answer is actually hidden in there. And one example, which is kind of simple, was your plane is X amount of pounds overweight. How much fuel do you need to drain, right? And you're supposed to know off the top of your head that there are six pounds of fuel in every gallon of fuel, right? And if you're not sure about that, though, you can look through to the charts for the weight and balance of the aircraft and see that they're counting six pounds of fuel, right? There was another question about whether specific things are in mean sea level or AGL or something else. And I was pretty sure it was sea level because that would make more sense. But I went through and I looked at all those and I confirmed that, oh yeah, at the higher altitude airports, these are higher up. Therefore, that, su that suggests that they are sea level rather than AGL. So, you know, use the resources available to you. It's not that difficult. And yeah, if you don't get 100%, it's not a big deal. Okay, so that's my update. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope to have some more good news in the future. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.